Okay. We won't spend as much time this morning on the um, preparatory prayers because we have because there is a lot of information and I want to make sure we get through it. But we will. Do. I'll try not to ask any questions. Well, once we get into the into the meat of it, yeah. I mean, I think it, questions will probably be raised, and it's it will be good to talk about it. All right, Christopher practically has realized emptiness now. I don't know. I don't think so. I think I, <laughs> I don't think so. I'll let you know when I do. Hmm. Okay. So uh, we'll start with the taking refuge in Jenny Chito, once in English, twice in the Benton I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the positive potential I create by listening to teachings and the other paramitas, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Sangye chadang sukhi chognam la jang chu bardo dagni kyap suji dagi jin so dipe sonam ki drola penchir sangye drupa gusho sangye chadang sukhi chognam la Jang chu bardu dagni yasu chi dagi jin so di pe so nam ki dro la pen chir sangye rupa shu. The four measurable thoughts which the Buddha Chen Rezig is the embodiment of. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. And uh, then we will do the uh, Manjushri Mantra Om A Ra Pa Sa Na D. And just it will suffice to say today that the essence of this mantra is uh, all it's all about emptiness and that there is nothing in existence, period, that has an independent self existent nature and everything continually, moment to moment, arises dependent on causes and conditions. <clears throat> and, all, and all the ramifications of what that, what that would indicate. Okay. Omara Patsana di, 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 Omara Patsana di. Omar Abatsana di 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 Omar and just a reminder that that D D D is the um um comes from the root bud, which means to awaken, and it's an internal awakening. It's the awakening of our um our internal wisdom is what we're what we're talking about here. Um then is the, here is the um, the seven limb prayer, which is a, uh, a prayer in outline form uh, that outlines the practice, the seven limb practice, which is a practice uh, that functions as uh, both uh, purifying. It purifies. It's a way for us to purify our karma, 
uh, our negative karma. And it's also a way for us to grow our root virtues and our um, merit or our positive potential. So all of this is, is contained in this practice. This is just an outline of that practice. And it is, according to the Buddha, it's the very first phase of practice that we really should be doing. If we, if we want to have a mind that's Mm. stable and clear enough to be able to have a realization of emptiness we need to start with these initial practices so here we go reverently i prostrate with my body speech and mind and present clouds of every type of offering actual and mentally transformed i declare all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the merits of all holy and ordinary beings Please remain until samsara ends and turn the wheel of dharma for sentient beings. I dedicate the merit created by myself and others to the great enlightenment. And uh, another translation for merit here would be um, positive potential. I dedicate the positive potential generated by myself and others to the enlightenment for all, all beings. And then we close with we close the opening prayers with um, this mandala offering. And here, what we want to imagine is that um, enlightened beings and bodhisattvas and our spiritual teachers are in the space in front of us, um, and that what we are making an offering, what we're offering here, is our intention to um, be part of the process that that helps all sentient beings. Um, become free from suffering and achieve a state of mind where they are completely happy. And so what we want to imagine that we are holding in our hands here every conscious being that exists in the universe. And this is our sort of our dedication and our prayer that we, we, we intend to work for their benefit. And we make this as an offering to uh, the aligned beings and our, our spiritual teachers in the space in front of us. Sajipa ki jokshin me to Tram ri ram ling ji Ni de gen pa di Sang ye jin do mi de And then we make that offering as we say, Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Niriyatayami. All right, today we have a interesting um, uh, topic, which is uh, in, uh, in Nagarjuna's text, He's getting into a deeper, deeper understanding of how um, the self and consciousness are related, and how they the the intersection, the interaction between self and consciousness. And so we'll we'll do a little bit of a review of what we talked about last time, and then go on to some of uh, to one of the new uh, new sections of Narayana. And then what I decided to do is. Um, talk about uh, several, four different um, neuroscientists and cognitive scientists who are sort of on the, or have been on the cutting edge of neuroscience during the past 20 years as the neuroscience is, is rapidly developing. And to, and to go over each one of their particular views of consciousness and compare it with the Buddha's view of consciousness. Because one could say, as uh, Venerable Rabina Porton has said, uh, the Buddha is, um, his, his expertise is consciousness. You could even think of Buddha as a, a kind of a sci scientist of consciousness, that uh, combining that, that, uh, that scientific view of consciousness with an immense level of um, compassion, compassionate action. So uh, and some of these some of these uh, some of these neuroscientists also have a very strong compassionate element that's evident from from their their writings. 
So it's it's a makes a very interesting comparison, and I think it um, helps to to clarify uh, the Buddha view, and also the Buddha view helps to sort of put into clear perspective what these particular scientists are are um, uh, postulating. So, um, just to add to that, we are nothing but. A con you know, consciousness. Well, we have a form. We have yeah. a form which arises based on our consciousness. And so this exploration and, and uh, investigation and, you know, work to understand the nature of consciousness, our consciousness in particular, is not like an interesting topic that's some kind of side dish in life. It is actually it's the main dish. <laughs> it's the main dish. And um, one of the ways that they tell us that when they say what we are is we're a, a river of mental moments of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So all you have, when all when all is said and done, all you have, all you have, all you have. There is nothing else to have. I guess all you have is this momentary trajectory of your consciousness. The yeah. whole point of Buddhism is to get a handle on that and to direct it in a way that's beneficial. So this explanation, I'm just this is my observation as Christopher has been reading and talking this week. It's like, you know, this is it, folks. This is not some side topic. <laughs> <laughs> okay it's interesting i mean it is of course it's interesting but it's the reason it's interesting is because what it what it says about the nature of reality what these you know there are many many uh places where uh what these neuroscientists and cognitive scientists in their theories they are intersecting with a lot of the buddhist uh buddhist views so you there is you can see there is a track there, uh, and it becomes clearer, I think, by by the comparative uh, observation. Yeah. yeah, we sometimes I think uh, thinking about that, one could say, well, how does compassion, love, and compassion factor into <laughs> this? And um, what could be more joyful than to have a full realization of how you do actually exist and feel at liberty to work with what you are and in, in, in as opposed to struggling against all these other factors. There's one, um, and I'll stop after this, I promise, there's one translation of the four measurables that I use on a regular basis, and I want to share the this is, you know, that thing we say, this is generating love and compassion, may all sentient beings have happiness and so on. May all sentient beings do this, may all sentient beings do that. Well, the translation that I have of this one particular practice I do starts with the words, having become free from attachment and aversion that holds some as close and others distant, may all sentient beings have happiness. Yeah. And so it's telling you right there how, how does happen? one have happiness? How it's going to happen? You become free from attachment and aversion. Right. How do you become free from attachment and aversion? You understand the nature of how things exist, which then liberates you from the deluded reactions to the appearing shit. Well, know? first we have to understand it, and okay. then then we have to then we have to actually directly realize it. Yeah, well, I yeah. and but we're we're in the phase of trying to understand that right now, or at least I am. <laughs> um, so we're gonna we'll start with a review of the last session, which was session twenty two. This is important. What well, we we clarified the distinction between what's called the self of persons and the self of phenomena. The self of persons always refers to the sense or idea of an I or a me. <laughs> That sense or idea of I or me. That's always what person, the self of persons, is, is referring to. 
We grasp at I or me as if it was some kind of self-existent entity, as if it's truly who we are. It's truly who we are. That's who I am, I am me. <laughs> when in fact, um, according to the Buddha, the I or the me is nothing more than a label for the collection of the psychophysical aggregates that make up the individual. In contrast, the self of phenomena refers to all phenomena other than the I or me. We grasp at these phenomena as well, as if they also had a kind of self or individual identity. For instance, we'll say, uh, the iPhone's case, as if the iPhone somehow had this identity or self, and the iPhone had a case that was its, that it was the owner of, or we'll say uh, the bell of uh, the cup's color, as if the color somehow belonged to this entity cup. So we also project a kind of self onto all phenomena, and most importantly, we we projected onto the phenomena of our psychophysical aggregates, which are not the same as the I or me. And that's very important to make that distinction. Grasping at the inherent existence of the aggregate, aggregates that make up a person is not the same as grasping at this idea of I or me. Therefore, grasping at the aggregates, the aggregates are a collection of integrated phenomena that serve as the basis of designation for the I or me. So when we grasp at the aggregates as being inherently existent, such as an inherently existent body, inherently existing feelings, an inherently existing consciousness and stuff like that, uh, that's an example of grasping at the self of phenomena. So it's very, really important to be clear about this distinction between the I and the aggregates, otherwise we could incorrectly uh, identify uh, what is called the object of negation when we're meditating on emptiness. If we're meditating on emptiness of the self or the I, uh, if we mix that in with the aggregates, we we won't be we will be losing the point. We will not have the object of meditation, which is which is actually quite subtle. <clears throat> I had a funny uh, metaphor the other day that I shared with Christopher, and he kind of liked this, which is he said, "It must be sort of like the I that we impose on the aggregates must be sort of like how we get with our phones, our iPhones, or our <laughs> yes, mobile like phones that. when we have the courage to leave them behind." Or, you know, to put them down and not... Um, I mean, look at what they even call these things. I thought. Uh, so it's like I, an I extension of me. I started toying with the idea as well, maybe I could just leave this notion of an I on the table, like I leave, you know, leave my phone. Which and we don't do enough. My life, <laughs> you know, go about my life. Right. Uh, just working with what's arising. Without an agenda, I said it's a good metaphor. I think. I, I mean, it, I think it could be helpful if we if we think along those lines. <laughs> I mean, we got to do something to start, you know, loosening up this grip we have on me. <laughs> um, let's see. To our ordinary minds, things appear to exist inherently. We can all see that. It's it's like they everything exists. It seems like it's all its its own little identity encased in itself and separate from everything else. Uh, but in re reality, things do not exist that way. Our ordinary minds are correct with respect to the conventional nature of things. For example, we, we know how to use a car to go to a grocery store. There's, you know, that, that's a functional thing. And, we, and that's an example of uh, an, a conventional understanding of the way things exist. Throughout the day when nothing special is happening, we have thoughts like, I'm walking, I'm reading, I'm thinking. Um, these thoughts correctly are apprehending conventional exist existence, and they're correctly apprehending the conventional existing I, when we're saying I'm walking, I'm thinking, I'm reading, without any kind of a, a strong grasping towards that. 
uh, they're mistaken. They become mistaken consciousnesses in that they uh, have the appearance of being truly existent. It appears that a truly existent I is driving a truly existent car to the truly existing grocery store. Now the big, well, it's difficult to distinguish between the uh, conventionally existing I and the mind apprehending the innate I grasping. And so this is where the subtle, subtle difference comes in. The reason it's difficult to tell the difference is because the, um, uh, the a true existence appears to both of those minds. Like I said, it seems like we're tr a truly existing me is getting in the truly existing car and is driving. Um, but when we're doing that without any kind of grasping at that, then that is just a, a valid conventional way of looking at things and being able to function with, with uh, the world as it appears to us. When, it, it, when we start to grasp at things like it's my car and if anybody dares block me on the road, I'm going to be really pissed off. Then we're grasping at uh, I, we're grasping at the car, and it's the grasping that is the difference. Is that clear? Kind of, I mean, because we really, we need to be able to, to distinguish the difference between these. Otherwise we won't understand what the object of negation is when we're meditating on emptiness. Yeah, uh, there's even a, I don't remember what text it is, but there's like a vow or a pledge that you will not despise your aggregates. Hmm. Meaning, yeah, there is, right, you're meaning, right. Meaning sort of, yeah. You won't mistakenly think that is what is to be. Yeah. I hate the okay. way I look. I hate the way I feel. I hate the blah, blah, blah. Oh. You know, so it's it's a kind of uh, anti-grasping. It's a, it's a um, it's an aversion based on, you know, you're grasping at what you want and you don't, and you don't think you're getting it, you know? So it's a form of, of uh, grasping onto an inherent existence. And that's where all of our problems arise. All of the suffering, all of the problems. Aggregates are not I, and I are not the aggregates. Right. The aggregates basically are the basis of designation for this concept right. of I. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the grasping is more sort of television. Mm -hmm. or, or very uh, attracted to something. Very I need it, I want it, I am uh, <laughs> Like that. So um, the challenge is to not be attached or grasp or uh, at anything uh, but still somehow enjoy the yeah. aspect of that thing, yeah. whatever that thing There's is. There's no problem with enjoyment. Yeah. The, I mean, the no, Buddha the said... Challenge, the challenge is to separate the grasping and the mm -hmm. attachment from the enjoyment. It's a huge challenge because it's so ingrained in us. You know, it, it was the, the grasping. They say what happens is, they say what happens is, well, will uh, something will appear to our consciousness and then it just appears there's nothing it's fine like conventional but immediately almost like a split second after that everything rushes in and we begin to grasp at it in some way whether either I like that I don't like that there's something wrong with the way this is placed on the table pay, table has spots you know that's when and immediately the grasping starts and all of these, aversions, little mini aversions and mini attachments arise and they get yeah. turned into big aversions and big attachments. There's a, um, I think it was a real deal or somebody like that, but an English speaking teacher said, it's like when you, you know, you have a little thing of bubbles and you blow bubbles. It can be really pretty and Delightful, let's say. We we often, you know, the light is right there. It's like, oh, isn't that, you know, mm -hmm. it's sort of uplifting. We don't need to then add bubbles and, you know. Come and be upset when they Yeah, we, we, yeah. We, can, we get that bubbles are just these very transitory phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, and I'm sorry Brian left, because when we... In, I mean, what the teaching says is when we encounter something that is that was delightful and pleases one of our senses, a smell, a taste, so forth, when we encounter such a thing, that uh, object we are encountering is only coming into our awareness due to an interaction with our consciousness. So 
what we're again doing is in that moment of delight about this appearing thing to separate out, we can maybe appreciate, well, some of my positive qualities are appearing as this delightful spring morning with flowers and bees and butterflies and leave really? it there and to not, you know, to re to just appreciate that that moment of positive appearance is arising without adding the layer of concretizing and wanting more of it. Even you could do it with say sex or chocolate cake or dare I say a cup of coffee. Oh, <laughs> dare we say it. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I just meant that. I'm gonna, I'm like on a, you know how I get. I know you all know how I get. I thought you weren't gonna say it yet. I know. <laughs> I'm just really aware this morning when I was doing my, I do a little bit of single pointed concentration. And for the first time in all these years, the thought arose. Oh, I'm trying to control what my very existence. I am consciousness. All these form and physical and uh, you know material arisings the teaching is that they arise in accordance with my propensities and my karma i am nothing but consciousness and here i am sitting doing nothing but trying to get a handle on the trajectory of my consciousness of me and it was like it's not like meditations over there and I'm sitting here trying to not have thoughts. It's different. Or to, in my case, I'm, I'm trying to meditate on a particular object and it's single pointed. So it's not like there's my life and all this other, it's like, this is it. This is where the, this is the work. This is the consciousness that I am trying to transform into a totally enlightened, only beneficial non-harming consciousness here I am sitting with it. And if I want to achieve that other thing of totally helping and never harming, obviously in this moment and in this practice, in all of our practices, I need to get a handle. And if you, I don't hate to use the word control, but it is essentially controlling that which I am. And so on this, in this moment, sitting on my seat, yeah, Brian, well, I was just going to say, I, I'm taking some classes in Mahamudra and Dzogchen right now, and 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 they they talk a lot about this as, um, uh, and I get and I showed you that one prayer, uh, which is Kuntasangpo Samantabhadra, the original, and and they talk about a lot about that, and there's these, these beautiful passages where basically they say when. When anger arises, for example, just or attachment, when it, when attachment, longing, desires, they they it says, uh, neither reject the longing desires nor accept attachment to desires. Let your consciousness relax in its own natural state. Then your awareness will be able to hold its own. Um, and then and same thing when it's like. Uh, when you're angry, you know, it's, 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 uh, when strong anger arises for you, neither reject nor accept it instead relax in that natural state and, and you'll achieve this wisdom of clarity. And so it is, it's that, it, it, you know, being able to things arise at, like a rainbow and you see it and you recognize that it's appearing, but you're not, you're not grasping at it because you wouldn't, you know, you, you see it for what it truly is. It's, yeah. it's a rainbow. It's not something you can grasp. Right. And there's this, apparently when you can really internalize this understanding of what we call the quote unquote external and just, like, there's just this release that comes this free, this wonderful feeling. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just reiterate it, it, that that there it is this tricky dance where they're like, well, don't push it away, but also don't grab it and just relax. I think and that's. I think <laughs> it's. <laughs> sort of, I, mean, I mean, the metaphor I would use there is like when you're driving a car, you can't. You know, you have to hold your own in your lane. You can't. Right. You don't want to aggressively 
fight what's happening around you because you will for sure get in an accident. But I guess I would just tuning a guitar string. I think the Buddha. Yeah, yeah. Right. like like no, too, not too tight, not too loose. Like you. But, I mean, I I both. I just want to. I don't know how you feel about this, Brian, but we do have to make choices about what we allow our minds to stay with in terms of the quality of the thoughts that are. And, and in other words, we don't want to allow ourselves to say, for example, fixate on jealousy towards someone. We want to, in, in our lineage, you know, now sort of in the mind training practice, you know, you engage with that jealousy, but you investigate it to try to depotentiate it, you know, to use. So it's not, I mean, we have a role to play as we watch our minds. Now, I know when you're doing a Mahamudra practice, it's a, it's a different animal. But... Yeah, those are good points. Um, I would, I mean, I totally agree with what you, you're, you both are saying. Um, the, what, what we tend to do is everything is arising. Attachment arises because we have the wrong view, because things appear to us as if they exist inherently. And then anger or uh, aversion arises when attachment doesn't get what it wants. So it's all related. So your point, Brian, is exactly on the mark. We can neither be attached nor have aversion for something. We have to sort of um, rest in a state of understanding that this all can be transformed if we just let it be what it is and don't uh, project onto it. It should be this. It should be that. I want it to be this. I don't like the way it is. Um, you know, my own thoughts, you know, we, we have to sort of transform them. And Kavita, your point about taking hold, hold of the wheel, that's the only way yeah. it's going to happen. It's the right. only way it's going to happen. I was going to say, to your point, Kavita, like, mm -hmm. it takes practice to do, to get to the point yeah. where you can't do that. So, yeah. yeah, it's not like it's just a, oh, this is just going to happen to recognize it. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, guess... you know, think about driving, like, say, in one of those lovely, like, I-10 through Houston, and you know, there's 12 lanes and there's shit happening all around you. Just relax. And yet, you know, and I know, like the most, the best drivers are quite relaxed, quite attentive. They're not quite going aware. like this. They're just, yeah. you know, aware and relaxed and ready to. Right. Drive. They're not on their phone. I mean, the distraction. But you can also tell them, you know, you know, I mean, I know for myself. Um, right. Mm. That. And thinking about how that works on the meditation cushion, and say you're trying to develop these things, you know, doing a Mahamudra practice where you're just taking it in. One of the ways that um, uh, current physics really, really aids us in this particular view. Who, whoever mentioned the rainbow? Did you mention the rainbow, Brian? Somebody mentioned the rainbow. I, I don't know. That you can't actually grasp it, right? Well, according to you. No, no, I think it was Brian. You can't, can't grasp it. And so because you know you can't grasp it, you're not attached to it, but you can just enjoy it for what it is. So according to uh, quantum physics now, and this has been for a long time, actually, they have found that you go down to the subtlest um, uh, subatomic particles. I don't know what they have names for them now, like love toys and whatever. But if you get down to these kind of particles, they all emit uh, rainbow-like light, like a prism. So... If we were to understand that, we would understand that everything that we are that's appearing to us has in its at its basis, it's just like rainbow like light. There's nothing that's like a rainbow, it can't actually be grasped. And so we just let it be what it is and not have the aversion and attachment toward it. So that's also kind of a thought you could have throughout the day is when you're looking at, you know, the person that you can't stand, you're going, oh, well, you know. At their at the basis of all this, it's just it's nothing that exists inherently. So why am I getting upset about it's this? It's your appearance. It's an, it's our appearance, right? It's your appearance. So we need to keep moving on. Our other words, we'll it's never get. Baby. We will never get beyond this. Um, so that's uh, so if we, if we rid our mind of this uh, of grasping <clears throat> and this aversion, then we will stop generating the negative uh, responses that result because of that. The problems and that will stop. Uh, the momentum that we've we've been developing for a long, long time of um, 
a wrong views, negative karma, and, the, and then the results. It's like sort of like a snowball. And it's uh, and we kind of evolve with this propensity, you know. And so we have to we have to take control of that. We have to stop it. And all of these techniques help. And we should be doing we should be using these techniques to sort of change the direction of our uh, uh, consciousness, the stream of our conscious uh, mind. OK, now and the last thing we talked about last time, just as an image of one's face is seen depending on a mirror, but doesn't actually exist as a face. So the conception of I exists depending on the aggregates. But like the image of one's face in the mirror, the I doesn't really exist at all. Grasping at the I as being truly existent is a mistaken consciousness. Basically, we're making a mistake. And the mistake is causing all the problems. And we just need to correct the mistake and find out how to do that. Grasping at the I as being truly existent is a mistaken consciousness. Those who are very experienced in meditating on emptiness and are close to realizing it directly say that to recognize the appearance of an inherently existing I as the object of negation is a difficult thing to do. But once this point is clear and the I as it appears to the innate grasping is directly identified, one is very close to realizing emptiness. So that's that's kind of a good signpost. Mm -hmm. The less, the less we be, the less grasping we see that we have, especially in as as we are in our meditations, you know, when we're really spending time on that, we can we can tell that we're getting closer, we're getting closer to a realization of what actually is going on, and we're not making the mistake anymore of of projecting kind of an inherent existence onto uh, the object of our awareness. So now we get to the next stanza, and those, these are the only. This is the only stanza we're going to cover this time because the the rest of it is going to be talking about uh, how Buddhism uh, is sort of an interface with current neuroscience. Stanza thirty three, just as without depending on a mirror, the image of one's face is not seen, so too the conception of I does not exist without depending on the yeah. aggregates, depending without on. depending on the aggregates. The conception of the eye does not exist without depending on the aggregates. You can't see your own face without a mirror. Yeah. And the eye doesn't exist without, without the, the aggregates. aggregates. Yeah. In the same way. So when the aggregates appear to us, they appear to be truly existent. You know, <clears> our, <throat> our body, our, our feelings, our mind, our senses, our sense of smell, taste, touch, they all appear to be truly existing. I mean, the whole package was right. calibrated to work with mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The aggregates, just as you say, the aggregates work together so seamlessly that they create the sense of a single being. This appearance quickly induces the self-grasping that grasps the aggregates as truly existence. Oh, this is me. This is who I am. Don't you dare whatever to me. You know? I mean, it, how, how many people say, how dare they say that to me? They got in my lane. Yeah. How dare they do that? <laughs> you know, we grasp at me, right? I mean, I, um, I like and that. And it's, this is all the part of the package. Yeah. And then when we get very upset, if part of the package doesn't meet our liking or doesn't meet a certain standard that we think it should, you know, have. Uh, whereas what we should do is like what Brian was saying, just uh, we just see it as, you know, like a rainbow and don't grasp, just let it be what it is and don't get so upset or attached, you know, either way. Okay, now we, we need to do a review of the five aggregates. We need to do a review of the five aggregates. Otherwise, uh, we we won't understand what we're talking about when we're saying we're grasping at the aggregates. And when we get into the further discussion, it won't be as clear as it should be. We need to be very familiar uh, in, in in our in our 
as we proceed along this path, we need to be very familiar with what the aggregates are. Okay, so I'm going to go over this. We, we've gone over this before, but I'm going to do it again. The first aggregate is called form, and that re is referring, in our case, to the physical body. The second aggregate is called sensation. It's also uh, called feeling. These are physical or mental sensations and feelings, good, bad, or indifferent, or neutral, that, is, that are experienced through the contact, contact of the sense faculties with their corresponding objects, eye with visible form, ear with audible sounds, smell with odors, taste with uh, olfactory, no, whatever that is, uh, tongue, and the body with tangible things, and the mind with, with ideas and thoughts. So the mind is also considered as a sense, a sense consciousness. The third aggregate is called discrimination, and it's also called perception. This faculty recognizes and discriminates among things. And we can see we can easily do that. We can, we can discriminate between red and green and a square and a circle and an uh, iPhone and a computer. It's just automatic. We have that, we have that uh, ability to do. Um, the fourth aggregate, and this is a one to really really understand, and it took me a long time to understand what this aggregate was talking about. This fourth aggregate is called mental formations. It's also called compositional factors or conditioning. So you'll see this fourth aggregate with these three kinds of names, uh, uh, mental formations, compositional factors, and conditioning. So what is that talking about? This, this aggregate is re it refers to all the intentional actions of our body and speech that are formed by their preceding mental states. So there's a mental state that comes first, and then the thing comes out of our mouth, or we take some kind of action with our body based on, and sometimes we don't even, we're not even aware, we don't pick up that there's a mental state first, but it, but it occurs first. Um, so these are, this is why it's called mental formations. And so when these intentional actions of body, speech, and mind are taken together, they make up the factors that cause and condition or shape our karma and our evolving propensities. So this is a very important one. This is the one that is sort of setting our trajectory in motion, these mental formations. It's sort of conditioning our, our karma, our actions, which then conditions the trajectory which we're taking, be it beneficial or harmful or neutral. Uh, and then the final, the fifth aggregate is consciousness, and it's also called awareness. This refers to the five sense consciousnesses, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, plus the mental consciousness. So there are six of those consciousnesses. So when you take all of these together as a whole, the artificial assembly of the five aggregates, and the, way, and the reason I would say artificial is that um, these aggregates um, actually exist as these uh, separate things, but they, they are interdependent and they function together and work together. And so there's this sort of artifice of it being one thing, one one unified system, whereas it is actually made of parts. So they, they, they have a, this, this artificial assembly of the five aggregates forms the illusion of an individual I or me. This is how the I or me arises. It cannot arise without these aggregates. Everything we think of as I is a function of the aggregation of elements that perfectly work together giving the impression of a unified and independent being. And that's important for us to think about and become familiar with that idea and see what we think about it. Does that make sense to us? So here's how the eye appears. Without the appearance of the aggregates, eye grasping doesn't arise. The eye appears to innate eye grasping to be totally independent of everything else as if it was some kind of autonomous entity that uh, existed by itself, completely by itself. 
This false autonomous entity is what the object of negation is. So that's, we need to get really clear about that particular thing. When we're meditating on um, emptiness using the four essential points that we talked about in session 21, if it seems that the aggregates or the color of the body or the shape of the body appear to be mixed in with the innate eye grasping, then according to the prasangikas, we haven't arrived yet at the subtle object of negation. Uh, here's an interesting point also. The self of persons and the self of phenomena arise in a certain order, a particular order. First, the self-grasping of phenomena arises when the mind grasps the aggregates to be truly existent. Based on that, self-grasping of persons arises, grasping the I as being truly existent. However, when we attempt through meditation to disassemble the misconception we have of the I and aggregates, the order is reversed. First, we meditate on the selflessness of the person, our own I. Then we meditate on the selflessness of phenomena, our physical and mental aggregates, as well as uh, other uh, phenomena that appear to be, uh, to exist externally to us or outside of our physical and mental aggregates. There are two reasons for this reversed process sequence. First, when we contemplate how the I exists, it is relatively easy to see that it's dependent on its basis of de designation. And that's true, the aggregates. To be able to identify a person, all we have to do is perceive one or more of their ag aggregates. It can be an image of their face or body, the sound of their voice and so on. For instance, um, we, know, uh, we, we know that uh, Molly is here because we recognize the <laughs> black dog as being Molly. If there wasn't a black dog here, if there was a yellow cat, we wouldn't say Molly is here. So we, Molly, that idea of Molly is closely associated with, with the aggregates. Dependent the, on. Dependent, dependent on. Uh, when we hear Kovita's voice, when we hear that particular voice, we go, oh, Kovita's here. If we don't hear the voice, if we don't see the form, then Kovita's not here for us. So we can't, you can't even think you try to think of someone, think of like your mother or your father. You cannot even imagine them without imagining some one of their aggregates, be it their voice, the appearance of their face, the appearance of their body, their sense of humor, or even the way they smell. You know, we can remember all those things, but without any of that, that person will not appear, that I will not appear. So this lets us know that the I is, um, is, coming out of or is based on, is arising from the aggregates. So it's not difficult to see that the person or the I depends on the aggregates and is designated in dependence on them. It is more difficult though, to see that the aggregates are dependent. It's not as obvious that they also depend on their basis of designation. You really have to think about that a lot more than simply, oh yeah, the I. It's dependent on all of this. Well, what are my feelings dependent on? What is my consciousness dependent on? What, what, is, what is the body dependent on? It's more complicated. So they say that we do the I first, recognize that the I doesn't exist inherently and how it exists. And then we go to the, to the uh, aggregates. So- uh, Strangely makes more sense to me now that you are- unpacking this than it ever has. I mean, I mean too, I, I used to think, it. I used to think it like, why, why? It yeah, seems I like the to, others easier. Kind of, I thought the eye would be the hardest, but oddly now it's like, okay, so I'm, I'm just abandoning my iPhone. Yeah, yeah. Kind of feeling, it's like. So that's the first reason why it's important to uh, do the eye first and recognize the self grasping the phenomena second. The second reason is. Can I just, I'm gonna interrupt again. In a way, all we're doing is abandoning an attitude. An idea. The attitude of I. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm using the word attitude mm -hmm. intentionally, but yeah. we're just abandoning an idea. Mm -hmm. We don't go away. No. We, the existence of our consciousness and the existence of, you know, don't fall into that. It's just, we're just abandoning the addition of this. We're finding a new, we're, we're uh, developing a new way of conceiving and perceiving. 
who we are. <clears throat> uh, it, it, which which is really quite different from what we've been habituated to for a very, 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 very long time. So that's why it's such a big deal for us. Um, so the second reason, uh, uh, the self-grasping of the person, especially the view of a personal identity, is the primary cause of psychic existence, according to the Buddha. This is why we want to we want to get this one first, the I. So although all forms of self-grasping have to be refuted in order to attain liberation from cyclic existence, the worst in terms of provoking our afflictions and thus the creation of our polluted karma is the self-grasping of the person, the self-grasping at me or I. This is what this is what all of our afflictions arise because of this and all of the, uh, the negative actions that we take arise because of the me and the I. We're so attached to it. Uh, so that's why it's very important to um, negate the existence, the inherent existence of an I first. So although there's no difference in the object of negation or its subtlety with respect to the self-grasping of persons or the self-grasping of phenomena, the object of negation in both cases is inherent existence. That's what we're negating. Um, we begin meditating on the emptiness of the self of persons, the I first. All right, now we're going to go to... Uh, this comparison of Buddhism and neuroscience. As the, the Buddha outlined in his first public teaching in India over 2,500 years ago, the entire purpose of the Buddhist path, it's not just because it's interesting, the entire purpose of the Buddhist path to enlightenment is to completely uproot our own suffering through a direct realization of the ultimate nature of what existence is and to help others to do the same. That's the point. That's why the Buddha gave the teaching, the Four Noble Truths. Not just because it was curious and that we'd be curious about, wow, how do things exist? It's because it has to do with the wrong perception and conception of the way things exist is what's causing all of the problems that exist for us and others. So the process by which the cessation of suffering is accomplished involves a very deep and profound understanding of the nature of consciousness and the self. Currently, the nature of consciousness and the self is, is being vigorously explored by, um, in the fields of cognitive and behavioral neuroscience, computational neuroscience, cognitive science, and cognitive psychology. Over the past 20 years, the rapid growth in technology has transformed our experience of life on planet Earth and the way in which we communicate and interface with just about everything, if you think about it. I mean, this has changed everything. The way we do think, the way we think about things, the way we communicate with one another, everything. Neuroscientists and cognitive scientists are quickly advancing their views of consciousness and the nature of existence. For this reason, I think it's especially informative to make a comparison between um, some of these scientists and their views and the views of the Buddha. So we'll start with Anil Seth. Anil Seth was born in 1972. He's a British neuroscientist and professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sus Sussex in England. If anybody wonders what computational neuroscience is, it's kind of a uh, mathematically they compute the processes of neurons <laughs> to sort of predict how, you know, uh, we'll behave and function. It's a very it's very sophisticated and, and it's and it involves understanding pure math and it's you have to know a lot about math. So uh, Seth is is into this. He is a proponent of materialist explanations of consciousness and is currently among the most cited scholars on the topics of neuroscience and cognitive science globally. Anil Seth holds a BA and MA in natural science from the King's College, Cambridge and a PhD in computer science from the University of Sussex. He is the editor-in-chief of the journal Neuroscience of Consciousness and the author of the 2021 book, Being You, A New Science of Consciousness, which explores his theory of consciousness and the self. And that, that book was very well received. 
lots of uh, stuff on NPR about it. <laughs> um, being a proponent of materialism, Seth holds the view that matter is the fundamental substance in nature and that all things, including mental states and consciousnesses, are results of material interactions with material things. According to materialism, mind and consciousness are caused by physical processes, such as the neurochemistry of the human brain and nervous system, without which they cannot exist, without which uh, mind and consciousness cannot exist is what, is what uh, they are asserting. Seth argues that the brain uses statistical inference and predictive modeling to produce a controlled hallucination, which is a subjective rendering of the inside and outside world. This is what got all the attention, because what he's saying is through his through the um, computational neuroscience, the mathematics, they they've run the numbers to to show that the neurons uh, in the brain are setting up kind of a, mm, a predictive modeling, and they are they are producing a controlled hallucination of what's inside and outside of us. So these predictions, these the brain, the brain makes predictions. Sensory signals keep those predictions tied to their causes and subjective experiences are then created. The Buddha's view differs from Seth's view of consciousness being derived from matter. The Buddha asserts that although consciousness intimately interfaces with matter, with the brain, with the entire body, and with everything around us, <clears throat> Consciousness is not caused by any physical process. According to Buddhism, consciousness is beginningless, has the quality of being clear and aware, and continually arises from previous moments of consciousness. Buddhism does agree that phenomena don't exist the way they appear to our subjective sense consciousnesses. According to Buddhism, the independent, self-existing appearance of phenomena is illusory. So on one hand, he's, he's, he's agreeing with uh, Seth's view that what, what is appearing to us is kind of a hallucination. But on the other hand, he's saying it's not caused, consciousness is not being caused by matter. So there's the difference. Now we go to... You know this I don't know if you did this intentionally. Uh, I want. We've studied with uh, the monks, Geshe Drakpa, these four philosophical. Oh, absolutely! Tenets. It just reminds me of that. The tenets and the fact that you have these four. I mean, what that in a way is. I there's didn't a correlation. The only the only order I put these in was, I don't know what you'd say, intuitive. I didn't. I didn't think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I um, mean. It would be a really productive thing to. But I reminded me the this whole process reminds me of going through those That's what I'm saying. tenets. What it would be really right. productive is, yeah. for for those of us who think of ourselves as Buddhism and as Buddhists and want to, you know, take on the studies you know presented to us by our teachers. It would be fascinating to do a correlation between these views and the ancient Indian schools of tenets that mm -hmm. are being refuted by. You know, the in every one of these cases, in every one of these cases of the of uh, these different uh, neuroscientists, the Buddha agrees with certain aspects of what they're saying and then refutes other aspects. Yeah, well, I mean that's how yeah. the the ancient schools yeah. of tennis that we right. are that we studied in the books. Right. You know. Anyway, sorry. Just now we move on to David Chalmers. Um, David Chalmers was born in 1966. Uh, he's an Australian philosopher and cognitive scientist. He's a professor of philosophy and neural science at New York University, as well as co-director of NYU's Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness. Chalmers received his undergraduate degree in pure mathematics from the University of Adelaide in South Australia. 
He continued his studies at the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. In 1993, Chalmers received his PhD in philosophy and cognitive science from Indiana University, Bloomington. He received his first professorship at UC Santa Cruz in 1995. In 2002, Chalmers was appointed director of the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona. In 2004, he became the director of the Center for Consciousness at the Australian <laughs> National University. In 2014, Chalmers became a full-time professor at the philosophy department at New York University, where he continues, I think, to this day. In 2023, Chalmers won a bet made in 1998 for a case of wine with neuroscientist Christoph Koch that the neural underpinnings for consciousness would not be resolved by the year 2023, while Koch said he bet that they would be. Chalmers is best known for formulating what he calls the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness, as he describes in his 1996 book, The Conscious Mind, is to explain why and how humans and other organisms have subjective conscious experience, awareness of internal and external existence, and a subjective character of experience with a single point of view widely referred to as the I or ego. Chalmers makes a distinction between easy problems of consciousness, such as explaining how objects are discriminated or the verbal presentation of information, and the single hard problem, which he says is, why does the feeling which accompanies awareness of sensory information exist at all? The essential difference between the easy problems and the hard problem is that easy problems can be answered via the theory of physicalism, that everything supervenes or necessarily depends on some change in physical matter. In other words, things arise because physical, the matter changes. Chalmers, Chalmers criticizes physicalist explanations of mental experience, making him a proponent of the view that mental phenomena are not physical. Chalmers characterizes his view as what he calls naturalistic dualism. Naturalistic because he believes mental states naturally occur only when there is some difference in physical systems such as brains. And dualistic because he believes mental states exist distinct from and are not reducible to physical systems. So what he's saying is <clears throat> there'll be an, uh, an observation or change in the brain and the neurons will be apparent when there is a change in the mental consciousness. But what Chalmers is saying, it's not that the mental consciousness is being derived from that, it's just that they are affecting one another. On the whole, yeah, on the whole, the Buddha is in agreement with Chalmers' view that consciousness is distinct from matter in that it is not derived from it. Buddhism also asserts that consciousness interfaces intimately with the physical body so that a change in the physical body can affect the consciousness and vice versa. A change in consciousness can affect the body. And we all know that. We all know that. You know, how the way our, you know, if, if something happens to our body and, and, it's, and it's bothering us or hurts us, well, that will change. That will have an effect on our consciousness, on our mental state. And our mental state, if it's very, uh, if it's very positive and very open, it is going to have a change on the way our physical being uh, experiences things. So, so Chalmers is, there, you know, and on the whole, he's, he's, he's close to what the Buddha is, is talking about. Now we move to Christoph Koch, who made the bet with Chalmers. Christoph Koch uh, was born in 1956. He's a German-American neurophysiologist and computational neuroscientist, best known for his work on the neural basis of consciousness. He was the president and chief scientist 
of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle. He is also the chief scientist of the Tiny Blue Dot Foundation in Santa Monica, California, that funds research meant to alleviate suffering, anxiety, and other forms of distress in all people. Well, I will say from reading uh, Hawk's book, uh, uh, I it's something now that I am mine enough. So I, this is his latest book. What I what I took away from that is he's a very caring person, and he's he's truly interested in. Um, alleviating the suffering of other beings. And I found that to be a, a wonderful quality of his. Um, from 1986 until 2013, he was a professor at the California Institute of Technology. Koch re received a PhD in science, science for his work in the field of nonlinear information processing from the Max Planck Institute in Tübingen, Germany in 1982. He worked for four years at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT before joining in 1986 the newly started Computation and Neural Systems PhD program at the California Institute of Technology. Koch has authored more than 350 scientific papers and six books about how computers and neurons process information. All the way back since the early 1990s, uh, Christoph Koch has argued that identifying the mechanistic basis of consciousness is a problem that can easily be handled scientifically. He draws on integrated information theory, or ITT, integrated information theory, to make his case. This theory suggests that consciousness is the act of a brain's systems of neurons merging sensory, emotional, and cognitive information. So the neurons merge the sensory, emotional, and cognitive information. Because IIT suggests consciousness arises from the integration of information, Koch argues the experience is not limited to the human brain and is present in other animals. He says humans, whose brain networks have among the highest known level of interconnectivity, have a more expanded consciousness than, for instance, a dog. One of the provocative conclusions that Koch makes is that any system that integrates information, including a computer, has the potential to be conscious. He explains that the very mechanism of integrating information is experience. So a system's consciousness can be measured by measuring the amount of integrated information within it. As an AI learns more information and performs more complex tasks, it becomes increasingly sophisticated. But Koch says it cannot reach or even simulate human level consciousness. One can simulate a black hole on a computer, but it doesn't mean you're going to be sucked into a real black hole. If you simulate a human brain in an AI system, it won't be consciousness. It's a deep fake, he says. According to Koch, the underlying hardware of a computer doesn't have the causal power necessary to give rise to human level consciousness. Koch contends that the subjective experiences that make us conscious are what transform us and the paths of our lives. He says our conscious experiences are real and precious, if nothing more than because they matter to ourselves. In 2023, Koch lost a 25-year bet to David Chalmers. Koch bet that the neural underpinnings of consciousness will be well understood by 2023, mm -hmm. while Chalmers bet the contrary. Upon losing, Koch gifted Chalmers with a case of very fine wine. The Buddha, of course, would disagree that consciousness arises from matter. However, Koch's description of the integrated process and functioning of consciousness how it merges with sensory and cognitive information is very similar to the way Buddha explains the functioning of the psychophysical aggregates. Koch's assertion that our conscious experiences are what transform us and the path of our lives is in complete accord 
with the Buddha's view of consciousness. So you can see there are aspects of Kark who, who, who even says consciousness can be can be derived, can be proven that it can be derived from uh, non-consciousness. Even there, uh, what Kark what is finding about the of nature of consciousness is in accordance with with what the Buddha is saying, how consciousness functions. Now we move to the last guy, who uh, uh, Arthur introduced us to, Donald Hoffman. Donald Hoffman was born in 1955. Yay! In my year, I was born in 1955. And he was born in San Antonio, Texas. That's wild. But, so Donald Hoffman is an American cognitive psychologist and popular science author. He is a professor in the Department of Cognitive Sciences at the University of California, Irvine, with joint appointments in the Department of Philosophy, the Department of Logic and Philosophy of Science, and the School of Computer Science. Hoffman received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Quantitative Psychology from the University of California at Los Angeles in 1978 and earned his Doctorate of Philosophy in Computational Psychology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in 1983. He was briefly a research scientist at the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory of MIT, and then became assistant professor at the University of California at Irvine in 1983. He has remained on the faculty of UCI uh, since then. So Hoffman notes that the commonly held view that brain activity causes conscious experience has so far proven to be difficult to solve in terms of scientific explanation. Hoffman provo provo proposes a solution to David Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness by adopting the reverse view that consciousness causes brain activity and in fact creates all objects and properties of the physical world. To this end, Hoffman has developed and combined two theories, which he calls the multimodal user interface theory of perception and conscious realism. The multimodal user interface theory of perception states that perceptual experiences do not match or approximate properties of the objective world, but instead provide a simplified species specific user interface to that world. Hmm. Hoffman argues that conscious beings have not evolved to perceive the world as it actually is, but have evolved to perceive the world in a way that maximizes what he calls fitness payoffs. Fitness what? Payoffs. Oh, okay. Payoff. Payoff, a fitness payoff. You receive the world according to what will be the payoff for you. Hoffman uses the metaphor of a computer desktop and icons. The icons of a computer desktop provide a functional interface so that the user does not have to deal with the underlying programming and electronics in order to use the computer efficiently. Similarly, objects that we perceive in time and space are metaphorical icons that act as our interface to the world and enable us to function as efficiently as possible without having to deal with the overwhelming amount of data underlying reality. Does this sound familiar that, at all? You know, it boils down to it's merely imputed. Well, it also is, is <laughs> it's alluding to the difference between conventional reality, which enables us to function, yeah. and ultimate yeah. reality, the underlying nature of what's going on. Yeah, that's neat. I mean, this is very interesting that, you know, he's achieved this, through, you know, honestly, I think you could have a really popular Buddhist book on correlating current neuroscience with well, old uh, traditional. Well, I mean, we'll probably continue with this, but I think it's important. It's I'm really just, interesting. Uh, as a side project for yourself. 
Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> or maybe I'll do. Um, yeah. The interface theory of perception is the idea that our perceptual experiences don't necessarily map onto what exists in reality. Now we go to a second theory, the theory of conscious realism. This theory holds that consciousness is the primary reality and the physical world emerges from that. The objective world consists of conscious agents and their experiences, not a world of unconscious particles and fields. Those particles and fields are icons in the multimodal user interface of conscious agents, but are not themselves fundamental inhabitants of the objective world. Consciousness is fundamental to Hoffman. Together, the multimodal user interface theory and conscious realism theory form the foundation for an overall theory that the physical world is not objective, but is a secondary phenomenon caused by consciousness. Hoffman has said that some form of reality may exist, but may be completely different from the reality our brains model and perceive. Reality may not be made of space, time, and physical objects. Through supposing that consciousness is fundamental, Hoffman provides a possible solution to Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness, which wrestles with the notion of why we seem to have conscious immediate experiences and how sentient beings could arise from seemingly non-sentient matter. Hoffman argues that consciousness is more fundamental than the objects and patterns perceived by consciousness. We have conscious experiences because consciousness is posited as a fundamental aspect of reality. The problem of how sentient beings arise from seemingly non-sentient matter is also addressed because it alters the notion of non-sentient matter. Perceptions of non-sentient matter are mere byproducts of consciousness and don't necessarily reflect reality. This means the causal notion of non-sentient matter developing into sentient beings is open to question. Hoffman argues the natural selection is necessarily directed toward fit fitness payoffs and that organisms develop internal models of reality that increase these fitness payoffs. This means that organisms develop a perception of the world that is directed toward fitness and not reality. What is fit to them and not reality? It's this kind of survival. Is what well, for instance, a, 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 a daddy long legs, a da daddy long legs has a different, he's checking it out. A daddy long legs has a completely different perception of, of objective existence than humans do. Completely different. And it's, it's, it's because it's based on what is fit for the daddy long legs. As, as, but yeah. for humans, this yeah, is yeah. what is fit for humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I think is what he's saying. Yeah, it is. Um, so it's, this has led Hoffman to argue that evolution has developed sensory systems in organisms that have high fitness but don't offer a correct perception of reality. So... Going to, reality going, to, to, going to the Buddha's view now. Hoffman's combined theories of a multimodal user interface and conscious realism have characteristics that are similar to the Buddhist view. Buddhism asserts that consciousness is beginningless and is therefore fundamental to every experience of reality. Buddhism asserts that all consciousness is subjective not objective, that the three spheres of agent, action, and object are empty of any kind of independent self-existence and arise dependently on one another, as well as other things. Buddhism asserts that each realm of existence appears to each sentient being 
depending on the evolution of each sentient being's consciousness and karma. Remember, if you think of karma as an evolving, uh, an evolving uh, trajectory that we have generated based on our actions of body, speech, and mind, and that we can, can we can change that evolutionary trajectory by by changing the nature of of the actions of our body, speech, and mind, then you can see karma as an of a as a as an evolutionary kind of model that the, the Buddha is using. We normally don't think of it in those terms, but as it functions, you can see as we change our karma, we change the direction we're, we're, we're evolving. Um, ah, uh, Buddhism asserts that phenomena don't ultimately exist the way they conventionally appear to us. Uh, Buddhism asserts that the appearance of conventional reality allows us to interface with the world and function efficiently in it, and that ultimate reality is completely different from, yet underlies and permeates the conventional reality conceived and perceived by our psychophysical aggregates. So, as you can see, Hoffman's view is probably the closest of the four. Uh, to to the Buddhas, and I think it helps us. I think it hel it's helped me to sort of clarify and put into a perspective what the what the Buddha has been saying. As it, it, when you compare it to these other great minds, really, they're great minds, and they are they are. I don't think they're doing this just to be just because it's interesting. But for sure, Christoph Koch has has a uh, uh, has a sense of wanting to be a benefit to other beings in, in the work that he does. I know Donald Hoffman does, because uh, I've listened to his uh, interview and he's, he's definitely that way. And I would assume that uh, Chalmers for sure is that way. And I, I don't know about Enyil Seth, but you can see how the, these views of the of various scientists are similar to when we study the Buddhism system of tenets and they go from the, uh, from the most, um, a gross view to increasingly increasingly finer and more subtle view until it finally gets to the highest the prasangika system but it but those that's an evolution of thought and you know this this to me was it was very interesting and i you know just wanted to share that with all of you because i think it helps us in our understanding of buddhism and how how it relates with the world and helps us understand in ways our experience of the world when we compare it to the views of these other neuroscientists, which are, I think almost all of them, almost all of them are saying that the world that we perceive, it, it objectively doesn't exist the way we perceive it. Yeah. Any, any thoughts on any of that? Well, you give us a lot to think about. I'll say that. Um, and I'm not sure I have thought about it enough to know any erudite to say about any of them. Um, you know, a bit of this is still the chicken and egg kind of question. And I don't think there's ever an answer. Well, there is an answer somewhere. I mean, you know, and, you know, this last. This last bit with Hoffman, and is he the YouTube thing you sent around? He's the YouTube, yeah. He's the one that Arthur uh, sent. I'll have to send that to you because it's, it's quite a long. YouTube. It's a long one. You need to take a few naps, <laughs> just like I did a few naps here. Uh, you know, it strikes me a little bit about a little bit circular in in nature, and and again. You know, whether consciousness is dictating everything or whether something else is dictating consciousness or it's a mixture of both and whether consciousness really actually explains evolution and that and and it's just a concept that's a little bit difficult to grasp whether or not it's related to the Buddhist philosophy yeah. or, or not. Well, basically, consciousness is, <laughs> according to Buddhism, it's, it's the aspect of Existence that is aware. That's aware. But I think that experience often, is... if I understand it is what you're saying is taking it another step in that consciousness actually has created the 
path of evolution that exists for any sentient being and it's based upon that consciousness is reality that then dictates what that sentient being right. does, doesn't do, develops, doesn't develop, he evolves, he doesn't evolve, etc. that kind of thing. Right. He's, he's saying, he's basically saying consciousness is foundational. Yes. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, that it's under the selection is totally surprising because essentially you want to filter out the stuff that doesn't matter to your survival. That makes sense. So it? you end up with something that we only need a few senses to sort of function in this environment, mm -hmm. so we don't run into a tree right. um, or eat that kind of stuff. Right. Right. You know, and, and and the Buddhist the Buddhist view of consciousness is that it is beginningless, and in that sense, it is fundamental to how existence is experienced. I guess maybe the thing is, you know, you can think of evolution as more of a random stochastic process where things happen, sentient beings have to respond to what happens and for whatever reason, those that respond in a more appropriate way don't run into the tree versus- right. So it's a selection. Right, right. So, and, yeah, so is it just a pure random selection and that's what guides it or is there actually some structure from a consciousness standpoint that guides you to that I don't know. What I would say is what you just talked about random uh, and, and, and you know, what happens is this is, this is karma. Karma is like that, too, because what happens is things happen and, and, and it causes us problems. And eventually, over time, we learn don't behave this way. Don't think this way. Don't act this way, because otherwise this and this is going to happen. We're, I mean, we're told, you know, don't mm -hmm. our mother tells us, don't put your hand on the hot stove. Otherwise, it's going to get burned. Well, that's. Karma, that's an action that that shows that, oh, that, that hurt. So I, I'm saying that the karma, the way the Buddhism presents it, is kind of an evolutionary process. It's not like uh, we're only at this point in our development are we beginning to think we can actually choose, we can make a decision about what we do, how we think, uh, speak, and act, because that will make a change. We can begin to see... Oh, this is how it's working. And so it is kind of like a selective uh, process. What works? What what what's what works? You know, this the, was the it's a bit circular because it's a bit chicken and egg because it's like, you know, is it the consciousness that drives it? Is it the response that drives the consciousness to adapt? You know, is it both? I mean, so I'm just saying, you know, from the uh, all I yeah, all I know is this it, it, we wouldn't experience anything without consciousness. Yeah. So I don't know what else to say. No, I, I, yeah, I'm not saying, yeah. you know, I mean, I think you did a very elegant, I'm not, usual job describing these four different uh, theories on how they relate to Buddhism. Uh, I think it will be interesting. I mean, they're building computers now with uh, neurons. So oh, boy. <laughs> what happens to Real them. neurons. Yeah, actually neurons. Uh, so it's not just part of physical. Uh -huh. so. so it's what, what are they calling this? Transhumanism in a way. Yeah, they, uh, you know, and yeah, I think they look at it. This, they look at it as a computational tool. Yeah, but we have yeah. no idea what it does. Right. Well, how are they? I mean, are we are we saying like human neurons or? I don't know what the, uh, the you know. Is, uh, you can. The they are grown by you know. You have bioelectric interfaces. You know, where, where they're growing. The material. Basically. They're growing right. Well, this also ties in with the right. idea of transhumanism. There's an opposite. There's an opposite view where. Um, uh, what, how do they put it? Um, those nanoparticle, there are nanoparticle particulates that can be injected into now, into the, you know, just the way like you inject a, put a needle. It can go into your system, they, they can be directed to go to a particular place in your brain, and then they self-assemble. And then they, they connect and they hook you up, hook the human up to internet and things like that. Uh, Elon Musk talks about this. I've seen him on YouTube saying this. He says, you don't have to even get it implanted anymore. You have a little injection. And... Well, that's a, the method I, of implanting. That's the, in, yeah. You, you don't have to cut a hole in your brain. Well, I think right now he still has to cut a hole in the brain. I think he said he had it done. I don't know. So I mean, things not quite it. <laughs> I, have yeah. no, I mean, I'm not making any judgments about Elon Musk. All I know is you hear people say these things and that's sort of like the reverse form of 
a transhumanistic. Uh, but you know, if you look thing. at what Koch has said in his recent book, you know, I mean, in this question about building these transhuman or these computer man machine interface kinds of things, and you know, the problem you have is that you know, still the computer does things in a very serial fashion, or you can set up a number of parallel serial processes to speed things up. Right. But if you look at the human brain and the neurons in the human brain, you know, every single neuron probably has thousands of other connections to other neurons right. and inputs and outputs. And so trying to recreate that in a physical way is extremely, still very, very well, it's impossible to do. So the question is whether it will ever be possible. To, I, I don't know. Well, well, not only that, but you, the the harder hard <laughs> question in, is um, we will never know what the subjective experience of that is. You can't know the, uh, and I think this this is, and there's a lot that the, the last gentleman's Hoffman, I believe, there's a lot that overlaps, I think, with the mind only school, um, but um, you know, which I, I, you can kind of summarize by if a tree falls in the forest, you know, does it make a sound? And the answer would be what tree, <laughs> what forest? Like <laughs> there, if there's no perceiver, that's right. Know, the right. perceiver is prime, you know, or at least they are generated from the same karmic seed, the, the external and the perceiver. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I agree, Brian. I think in a lot of ways, like folks think we're a lot closer computationally to creating mm -hmm. and mimicking consciousness than we truly are. Right. Um, because again, the real fundamental problem is, you know, I can open someone's brain and tap on something and they'll say, oh, I'm seeing red, but there's still no way for us to know that what they're, even if we're using the same word red, that what they're perceiving and experiencing matches my, what I call and label the subjective experience of red. There's just, there is no way of, at least according to our current, yeah. uh, if that makes any, I mean, I, and that's what I've heard from some teachers uh, when they talk about emptiness and perceiving emptiness is, is and, and what they see as the fundamental question of consciousness and, and which is why they encourage they why I think the Dalai Lama says that science needs the tool of meditation mm. if it's really going to advance. The, in other words, like the answer is not just going to come from computation and math and stuff. It's also it requires meditation and the experience, the subjective experiences that occur in those deep states to mm. really get insight into these bigger questions. And I don't know, that that's what really kind of blows my mind is, yeah. is I don't know. I know that some of these uh, scientists, they practice meditation as well. They do. But yeah. again, I want, sorry, it, it, I just want to say that, look, and I've said this repeatedly, every time you meditate, you concentrate on something and you think about something and every time you're told something by someone else or especially someone you respect or who has more knowledge you or whatever you know it creates a an opportunity for your mind to change and align with a belief that may or may not be a true belief meditation is the same way if I convince myself long enough that emptiness is real and I convince myself eventually I've had a realization, who's to say my realization of emptiness is the same as yours, Brian? Or, you know, I mean, so... No, I, I, you're right. You're right. I think that's accurate. Yeah. I, I think that's what we have to be dealing with. That it, it, it's all subjective. Consciousness is subjective. Experience is subjective. No, but then how is anything at all consistent or how do you how do you function in any way everything is subjective well we have this conventional we have conventions that we all will agree upon we'll all agree this is some kind of red right <laughs> no matter what it looks like you know science itself brian herman dr herman <laughs> science itself from the buddhist point of view Science itself is an entirely subjective, computed thing. It so always there is no. It doesn't matter. You're, in a way, your question doesn't even matter. 
I mean, perhaps, 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 but they're waiting for C yeah, but, but they're waiting. Well, it, it all matters to the extent that, that, as the Buddha said, I teach suffering and the ending of suffering. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's the right. point. That's why I said uh, that was the yes, initial yes, point. But yeah. the way we perceive things, we're probably all seeing very, very similar words because we all evolved from the same thing. We're all related, very closely related. Right. We have the same sensors and they function the same thing. So, I mean, I think we can be somewhat pragmatic and say, I mean, certain experiences are probably shared amongst all of us. So that this is the yellow shirt and that I see the same way Brian sees the disease. I think that I would claim that that's actually... It seems so, from the evidence that that's probably... We, we have the same so, sensors. Sorry. So it's just, Otherwise, how could we actually function? Right. I mean, this is sort of like what Brian Bales was saying about this. We don't know the subjective experience, uh, let's say, of the artificial intelligence mechanism that's having its seemingly conscious moment. Um, Uh-oh, I lost the thought. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> well so far, I didn't think the EM systems are just slowly surging. Yeah. Well, I, I guess... I think the next word, so they're not that deep. Well, I think my, my only point is, I think, you know, again, we, we, and even in science committee, everybody, we've talked about this, everybody has their own views, everybody has confirmation of biases, everybody thinks about things in a specific way. You try as carefully as you can to be fair, objective, neutral, et cetera, but it's still a very difficult thing to do. And now if you go and say consciousness is what drives your own interpretation of what you have and the only way you perceive, then and everything is subjective then everything is subjective and it's hard to know what is accurate and what is correct and what is true or what is real when i hear in your question brian is the implication and the assumption that there's some final definitive um Final definitive um, conclusion about a thing. Well, there is. That's what they. That's empty. That's the final. You know, unlike it, that's the. But it, but it's but the thing, thing is that what it's empty of is any kind of independent get functional. It, get it. Get it. So it. in a way, the problem that you're pointing out is only a problem. If you need there to be an a conclusion. All right, see, this is my problem. Yes, it's my problem because in a linear thinker, and you guys right. are all circular thinking, and I'm trying to figure out how to. We think of out. ourselves as spiral thinkers. I, no, I, I, I can think linear, no, linearly. Linear. Yeah, she, she's got this spiral. Well, thing. because yeah. circular implies you keep reading. And I also go, I want to circle back to uh, the meditation that His Holiness was referring to with regard to the analysis of scientific phenomena. Because he was not, uh, in my opinion, based on my own experience with analytical meditation, that's the type of meditation where you bring a thesis to mind and then you cognate, cognate over it. Yeah, so. And then you just keep going. What I have found um, is that it's not that I'm, again, it's highly subjective. What my own personal experience is that a novel insight arises and I then judge it. It all happens rather quickly mm -hmm. to whether or not it's logical or not. Mm -hmm. And that's how I conclude that I have made a temporary, I have a new uh, milestone in my temp and my ever ongoing unfolding understanding of which is, this one's hard to take in, on board because it points to what we you were just. There's no. There's going to be no final conclusion of, in terms of my consciousness, its own experience of how reality exists. So that's hard to take on. That when we talk about enlightenment, we keep concretizing. I think it's an ever expanding phenomenon. You know, consciousness and but, but I think existence. If I understand it correctly, maybe I misunderstand it, which would not be unusual. Um, you know, we are moving towards becoming enlightened. We are moving towards the uh, understanding of emptiness in order to not only deal with our own suffering, but the suffering of all yes. other sentient beings. And we 
are going to a point where we realize emptiness and become enlightened so that we can still live and go back in a conventional reality, but understand ultimate reality that that allows us to help ourselves and others, mm -hmm. you know, lessen suffering. So we uh, are, it seems to me, moving towards some, some, I don't know if I'd say goalpost or conclusion or place or whatever, that realizes it, it mm -hmm. gives us this realization of emptiness. I um, get yeah, what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, well, I, it's I, a marker. I liken yeah. it to being, I would liken it to being an accomplished musician. Once you're an accomplished musician, what, you know, you can interpret any kind of, you know, mm -hmm. let's say you can interpret any music that comes your way um, proficiently without. And I, I, all, I, all I meant, you know, what I was pointing towards was, let's, you know, imagine what it's like to be omniscient. It's, you know, they're playing, okay, so you're omniscient, but, you know, if the existence, the soup of existence is unfolding around you, it's not that you arrive at some static omniscience. You know, it's sort of like body surfing. It's, you're in the, so I don't know. You know, I mean, that's all. What the, what the Buddhist teachings say is that when we have achieved that realization of emptiness and we, are, when we have rid ourselves of all our cognitive obscurations and become enlightened, then when we're in this situation like we're in now, with that omniscient mind, not only do we see, do we perceive the conventional reality, but we also perceive and conceive the underlying ultimate reality at the same time in a way that we do not at the level that we're at. So it's a, it's a, it's a different experience the way they are describing it. But all we can base it on is, is previous things that the Buddha has said that seem to make some kind of sense to us. That's all I can be so. Let you know that I get your observation that we are all sort of prisoners of the notions that come into our consciousness. Hmm. And it's difficult for us to know when we're just oh, yeah. giving ourselves self-rewarding feedback of what we already believe, you know. And that's, you know, for I've been adopting new beliefs again, you know, and this yeah. is this is one of the challenges for me personally is trying to hear these alternate theories about what people think and you know and again maybe it's a fault of my career and my career choice and my experiences in life where I've had a lot of people tell me a lot of things they believe in which turn out to be completely batshit crazy mm -hmm. uh, and you know maybe, but maybe I'm batshit crazy and they're right I don't know <laughs> I don't actually myself I, I do not like the term belief at all because belief doesn't imply anything other than uh, just an idea that that you you know you think it might be true. And then the other thing yeah. I, I was saying, this is again personal experience. I mean, again, I've been around enough individuals whose minds work out of the normal Gaussian distribution of minds in our world. Mm -hmm. To see, you know, uh, that's a mind at work. It's a consciousness at work. Mm -hmm. And is it any, is it right or wrong or not right or wrong? Or, I mean, you know, we just say here's the normal distribution. But, mm -hmm. you know, we have plenty of people on each side of these distributions mm -hmm. who, who have consciousnesses and beliefs and structures and processes that are very different than what we consider, you know, normal. But I don't know that that's wrong or that's admirable. If you only right. do that because right. we mm -hmm. define it conventionally. Right, 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 right. So if and if those people's minds can believe the things that they believe versus our other mind, my mind or somebody else's mind who believes something very, very different, how do you put all that together in terms of this? I think the the Buddha's answer would be it's it's not this it's not really the question of what's correct or incorrect based on some uh, standard of correctness or incorrectness, but it's in terms of, is it beneficial or does it generate suffering? If something generates, generates suffering, then there's a problem there and, and it should be changed. Our view should be changed. If something is beneficial and it's not, it's not hurting any being, then there is no problem. You can't say it, right or wrong doesn't come into that. Uh, and I think that would be a more 
uh, fluid view rather than a what's right and what's wrong. You know, I don't think the Buddha, the Buddha will say things like this is the correct perception, this is a mistaken perception, but it's in relation to this mistaken perception is going to cause some kind of suffering for you. That's why it's a mistake. It goes back to that idea of uh, how we evolve and learn to uh, evolve in ways that, that work for us. And ways, and we don't evolve in ways that don't work unless we want to eliminate our species. You know. Well, yeah, I, 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 I get what you're saying, and I think you know that's that's fine. But this goes back to this kind of fundamental subjective experience that everyone has that that is their reality, and one person's subjective reality is very different from another other person's subjective reality, but the subjective reality. And one's consciousness really dictates what is, then what is. <laughs> you know, I was thinking maybe that uh, Kaufman's concept of, uh, you know, our consciousness develops, I put it in a way that helps us survive. So if you have a particular flavor of consciousness and it ends up in one of these human lives that we're so familiar with, Maybe some of the quirkier things we see, you know, as opposed to our main chunk of normies, one of the quirkier people are have evolved this belief system around their need to survive in a quirky world. I mean, 2,500 years ago, people had very different belief systems and the society worked as well. So mm -hmm. we can have a completely wrong impression of how the world works and society can still work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. We just have we to agree on it, part. right? Yeah. We, don't we have to right. agree on it. <laughs> and I believe that would be what the Buddha would call conventional reality. And, you know, when somebody's working uh, out of conventional reality and it's causing problems, then 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 this idea of suffering comes up. And, and I, I think the Buddha is saying... This is the whole point of his teaching is that we can eliminate, we can eradicate suffering by the choices we make uh, for ourselves and, and that others make, and we can help others in that way. We have to, we should, we're Stop. over, so I'll, we should do closing clears. But, you know, this is a conversation we could go on all day about, really. Oh, um, here. <laughs> yeah. All right, final dedication at the bottom of page three. Did you want to say something, Ann? Well, I, I think the only comment useful that I might say is that I think scientists tend to, like Anil Seth, prefer to work with conventional reality, things that we can, you know, touch and move and see and measure. Right. Whereas people like Hoffman are more into coming up with a theory. And at the end of his talk, I noticed he did advertise for two postdocs with advanced computational skills to help him submit his proposal. And I, th I think his, his talk may have been given prematurely from a science point of view. I mean, it was a great idea, but it's just an idea right now. He hasn't shown anything. That's right. And he admits that. He admits yeah. he has. And that's how he ended the talk. You're oh. advertising for uh, helpers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That was all. Yeah, and I, and I think the way for us, the way we can we all can prove the Buddhism path to ourselves by our experience of it, and is it is it making a difference in our in our thoughts and our the way we interact with others and our behavior and our speech? I mean, is it making a difference? That's good. That's beneficial for myself personally. I would say yes, definitely, absolutely. I can see. I am quite aware of the changes that have occurred. And I think they are, they're the good ones. There's a long way to go. I mean, a really long way to go, but maybe not as long as I think. I don't know, you know? All right. <laughs> and I, that could be the same for all well, of us. In response to what you just said, I'd be interested in hearing about what you see as your long way to go some other time. And to me, that would be as interesting as listening to Hoffman. <laughs> Somebody who's been no, practicing for a long time and has a clear sense of where they've been and where they're going. That would be useful. You know, as his wife, I can assure you that if he drops um, a cup of tea, he still says fuck. I do. I do. I, I'm I very annoyed. And yeah. if I ask him 
to not mow the lawn in a certain place that he thinks he should, he still looks at me like he wishes I would die. But I do agree. I do agree with her. So, you know, there's still, I mean, it's all, there's a, a long process we have to go, go through to eliminate all of our grasping at our point of view, right? All right. Anyway, <laughs> but that is yeah. Final that dedication is prayer. In all my lives, may I not be separated from true lamas and so enjoy the splendor of Dharma, fully perfecting the virtues of levels and paths. May I speedily attain the state of Vajradhara. I think we should also do the one about emptiness. Um, May the view of emptiness. May the view of emptiness, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. And we should remember that the purpose of this, I'll go back to the Buddhist first teaching. The purpose is that we can have a happy life free of suffering and that we can help others to have the same. That's the reason. Not just because it's cool. <laughs> Which it is. Which it is. It's interesting for sure. 